Welcome, everyone. So thanks a lot for coming to this talk and um, so preparing for a future microservices journey. In November 2010, Thomas Twait, a designer from the UK, um, gave, gave a really funny TED talk about, about his project that he accomplished before. And this project was called the Toaster Project, and it was about his idea to build a toaster from scratch. So he bought a very cheap toaster from his local appliance store for re-engineering purposes. And he started to disassemble it. And he was quite surprised that this very cheap toaster of £3.94 was consisting of 404 different parts made of 100 plus different materials. So since he does not have his entire lifetime to spend on this toaster project, he was focusing on five of them, steel, mica, copper, nickel, and plastic. And he went out on a quest for all these materials. So he went to a remote iron mine in the north of England and came back with a suitcase full of iron ore to extract steel from. He also was trekking to the um, highlands of Scotland in the search for mica. So his entire journey to build this toaster from scratch was uh, paved with a lot of failures and setbacks. But finally, after nine months, he managed to finish his toaster, and the result looked like this. <laughs> so why am I telling you this story about this toaster project? Because in some kind, it was reminding me of all the challenges and struggles that comes when introducing microservices. So when you start your journey to microservices, at first, you identify uh, good candidates for microservices, modeled around your business capabilities, your bounded context where domain model lives in. So each of the microservices shall own the state of the, uh, of the domain model. So they need to address data storage components. These data storage components need to be integrated into your service. And you need to configure, set up, and maintain those data storage components. Your services themselves has to have to be deployed on some kind of server, preferably packaged as containers. For communication purposes, you need to provide an API. Once other services would like to connect you, um, they need to integrate your service API. We need service discovery to which each service is going to be registered uh, that allows other services to discover and connect to you. In case multiple instances of our services are running, we need to integrate a load balancer that distributes the traffic and the workload. Since our microservices are running on a um, uh, slow and unreliable network, we have to design for failure to keep our system resilient. We have to introduce stability patterns such as timeout handling and retries to repeat an operation that timed out. With retries, we have to consider idempotency, that our operation is idempotent, so when it repeats its calls, uh, it's then leading to the same outcome. To preserve partial functionality when a failure occurred, we have to consider bulkheads. To protect our system against cascading failure, a circuit breaker can help you to isolate the failure. Uh, when we want to introduce event-driven service interaction, we, might, we, might, we need to introduce some kind of message broker that needs to be integrated by the services themselves, but also requires activities such as configuration and maintenance. We need uh, an API gateway as a single point of entry from the outside. Since our microservices are not only consisting of code, but also of configuration data, we need to have uh, some kind of um, centralized configuration management. Uh, we need definitely observability to generate a deep understanding of the health of our system. And we need to get a repo and a CI, CD pipeline. And in the end, also backup and recovery for failed services and components, and also scaling up and scaling down services as well. So to build one microservice, you have to take care of a lot of infrastructure and operational complexities. So, and that um, um, comes with a problem because that shifts the focus away from building your business domain to handling all these infrastructure and operational complexities. And if you are small teams, like coming from myself from a startup context, with little DevOps practice in place, um, you, might come, you might come up with compromises on things that you should not compromise compromises that would look like this. 
So now the question is, how can a small team um, handle the infrastructure and operational complexities and still deliver um, user and business value? One approach is to focus on your core domain that gives you a competitive advantage and offload commodities that are not differentiating you to, um, 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 from your competitors to someone else. And we definitely need to focus on our core domain, uh, the one that differentiates us from our competitors, since that's the one that generates, that fulfills the user needs and generates visible user value leading to satisfied customer. So the core domain is the one that we should strategically invest most, and that's the one that we should build in-house. To be able to focus on our core domain, we need to offload uh, the undifferentiating commodities to, uh, to someone else by outsourcing commodities to utility suppliers, because this helps us to reduce the delivery time for new features or to, de to decrease, to reduce the lead time for new features and to increase the software delivery performance, fulfilling uh, business values. So there is a four years research run by Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Jean Kim, and they have revealed uh, within their research that software delivery performance has a strong impact on the productivity, profitability, and market share of technology organizations. So software delivery performance is really crucial for a technology organization doing business today. So, Charlie already gave a fantastic intro, so I could skip this slide, but I am Susanne Kaiser. I'm from Hamburg, north of Germany, and uh, I am an independent tech consultant and helping organizations tackling complexities from software architecture to software delivery. I used to be a startup CTO, um, transforming their SaaS solution from monoliths to microservices. And yeah, as she mentioned, I am also involved as, uh, in a couple of uh, different tech um, conferences here in Berlin, in Hamburg, Copenhagen, and New York. Coming back, so how do you identify what to build in-house and um, that gives us competitive advantage and what to outsource to utility suppliers? And that's where Wardley Maps comes in. So who of you have heard of Wardley Maps before? A, a few hands, so for the majority it's new, so it's fantastic, you're learning something new. So um, Wardley Maps has been created, uh, this technique has been created by Simon Wardley, that's a researcher from the UK. And it's a landscape um, um, that where a business is operating in, and it, visu it visualizes the uh, evolution of a value chain. So what is a value chain? Um, behind every user need, there is a value chain. So, and it starts off with the question, who are your users? So who's coming to you to look for help? And what are their users' needs? What, their, what are the problems that they would like to get solved by you? And what are the components that fulfill these user needs, either directly or indirectly, facilitating other components in activities in your value chain? And how do these components depend on each other? And what is their position in the value chain? So at the top, we have those components that are visible to your users. So that are the components that, uh, where your users are, are touching your system. And at the bottom, we have those components that are less, less visible to, to our users. And we take this value chain after we have identified it and um, listed all the uh, dependent components, and we plotted this value chain along the evolution axis. And um, so the evolution axis goes from left to right. From uh, genesis, these are brand new things that have, have never existed before, to custom build, to product and rental. These are off-the-shelf products and open source software. And commodity and utility on the right. And the movement of a component along the x-axis is determined by its stage of evolution. So there, with Wartley maps, there come some patterns. And uh, the map is never static, but very dynamic. So everything evolves, evolves from left to right. And through the, forces to, uh, through the forces of demand and supply competition. And um, while the component evolves through the evolution stages, there are characteristic changes. So it goes from the left, from the genesis part, from the uncharted, unpredictable, uncertain, rare domain 
to the through the evolution stages, then to the left, uh, to the right, to the industrialized and uh, well-known, well-spread, um, commonly understood um, and just, um, uh, commodity evolution stage. And there's no choice of evolution. You have to continuously um, adapt. Otherwise, uh, you will get overtaken by others. And another pattern is that efficiency enables innovation. So the industrial, industrialization of one component enables um, new features of existing products to appear, or that other components can evolve, or that new components can emerge. And it's the genesis of new components that enables uh, user needs and creates future uh, source of value. So just kick off the patterns and now dive into an, an, an example. And that's focus on an example um, of a conference management solution. So what kind of users can um, interact with our conference solution? That could be the speakers, the conference organizers, also the attendees. Um, so let's keep it simplified, just focus on the speakers and the organizers. So the speaker might have the user need to submit a CFP containing the talk details and uh, his bio or their bio. And uh, the conference organizers uh, would like to view the task list and also to evaluate the submissions to categorize them for, uh, can for candidates uh, being um, accepted or being rejected. That also leads after the evaluation, you're actually then accepting and rejected your evaluated submissions. That, needs, uh, that leads to informing the speaker about the submission status. And uh, in case his, uh, their submission got uh, accepted, um, the speaker needs to confirm the submission. And at the end, the organizer can build and publish um, the confirmed submission. So the next question is, what are the involved components and their dependencies? So uh, we have then um, four different components that fulfills the, uh, the user needs directly. These are submission management, speaker communication, task handling, and session and schedule management. These are the components that your users are interacting directly with. Um, as a next component, um, we have the data storage component to, stay, to store the state of uh, the domain model. And this is less visible to the users. Since the organizer would like to search for, um, for the submissions uh, by content or search for speakers by name or list the topics, uh, list the submission by topic, fill the submission by topics, we need um, a search engine component. This search engine component is facilitating the submission management and the session and schedule management. Each of our services, and including the search engine and the data storage, needs an environment where the software is executed, the compute platform. And this compute platform is running on top of a virtual machine. So at this point, we have listed all involved components, including their dependency and position in the value chain. And now plot these, we are going to plot these um, components along the evolution axis. And the first draft could look like this. So we are planning to build our services into, um, to, to custom build them. So they go into the custom build evolution stage. And we are planning to use open source software for search engine and data storage. So they go into a product and rental. And they are packaged, each of them is packaged as a container, as a compute platform, and running on top of a cloud hosted virtual machine, which goes then to commodity and utility. And this allows us to identify um, which components, it's the, the evolution stages allows us to identify which components uh, to, to build in house. Um, for what components we can use um, uh, off-the-shelf products or open source software for, and what um, components to outsource to utility suppliers. Let's come back to the infrastructure and operational complexities that I was addressing before. So, and I would like to approach the mapping of these complexities by three different perspectives. 
First we go with a data cost perspective, then with the general service perspective and the service interactions perspective. Let's start with the data perspective. So for our um, data components related, uh, uh, for our data related components and activities, um, we have decided to um, use open source software, for example, for, um, for the search engine Elex Elasticsearch and for the data storage, for example, MongoDB. And we, if we run those components on-prem, um, premise, we have to provide um, activities such as configuration, um, backup mechanism, recovery, uh, ma um, uh, maintenance, scaling, and monitoring aspects. And these components need to be integrated into our services. The next perspective I would like to bring in is uh, the service-related components, the general components and activities that are necessary to run our services. So we need to have centralized, as I mentioned already before, we, uh, we need to have centralized configuration management, scaling, recovery, and for observability perspectives or aspects, we need to have distributed tracing, um, metrics gathering, um, log aggregation, and monitoring aspects. So the next perspective that I would like to address is the speaker, inter uh, the service interaction related components and activities. And um, so, and for every service interaction type, uh, there are different activities necessary. So let's start with the request-driven service interaction, where our services are communicating with each other directly over their API, for example, REST API, by sending commands to the service leading to a state change on the receiving service, or sending a query um, retrieving data from that service. So with this request-driven service interaction, um, we are, uh, can control, uh, it's, a it's a pretty simple integration and we can control the request flow itself. But with the downside we that we have high temporal coupling between the services, so one service can go down and that impacts the other service. So we have to design for failure. And with the event-driven service interaction, your services are not communicating with each other directly. Instead, they are publishing events to a message broker that can be consumed by other services independently at their own pace. So that flips the flow control to the receiving end. And it increases the, um, uh, the loose coupling between the services and the pluggability of consumers. But we need a separate component which needs to be, um, which requires the, um, additional activities. And then the hybrid model, we have um, the request patterns combined. We have request-driven and um, event-driven uh, combined. So we have event-driven communication, for, but only for notification purposes. And in case the service needs additional information, additional data, it does a remote query request um, to, to the um, source service. So how do these... Um, now look in our world map. Uh, so if we start with the request-driven service interaction, the first one, um, we, we need to provide an OP API, and this API needs to be integrated into other services, and we also need to, due to its direct service communication, we need to have service discovery and load balances, and an API gateway for an external request. Since um, due to the nature of high coupling between, uh, high temporal coupling between the services, we have to design for failure, introduce stability patterns such as um, timeout handling, retries, bulk heads, circuit breaker, and also item potency. With the event-driven and um, hybrid-related uh, component with um, a service interaction type, um, we, have, we are introducing a new component to our world limit, to our technology stack. So this leads to the activities of configuration, um, um, backup, recovery, maintenance, scaling, also monitoring aspects. And we also need to integrate this, um, this as a, into our services itself. So if we look at the stage of our world map right now, we, not we notice that we have a lot of activities uh, that are right now at the stage in custom build, which do not belong to our core domain. So we definitely have to, definitely have to evolve our technology stack. So the, the very first idea is that we can use open source software as much as possible. So. For example, I come from the Java context, so for example, uh, as a Java example, is um, to use Netflix, OSS, and uh, Spring Cloud for service discovery, load balancing, centralized configuration, and circuit breaker. 
Also using Prometheus, Grafana, the X stack, and Zipkin for um, metrics gathering, for monitoring aspects, um, aggregated logs, uh, distributed tracing. And Nginx as an API gateway as a single point of entry from the outside. So this shifts some of the um, custom built uh, activities from the custom built area um, to product and rental, but we still have to integrate those components into our business logic. Um, so that's still a lot of things to cover. As a next step, you can say um, to offload our, um, our data storage, data-related services to a cloud-hosted services, such as message broker, the search engine, and the data storage. So if you move them to a cloud house solution, it moves from the product and rental to the evolution stage. Then, so this allows us that um, all the activities that we have to take care before of are now handled by our cloud providers, and we don't have to, we can ignore them. For example, backup recovery, maintenance scaling, and um, monitoring aspects. But we still have to configure those components. These are still custom built, and definitely integrate them in our services. The next step, that, the next evolution step that we can consider is to um, offload some of the infrastructure and operational complexities to um, a con container orchestration platform. So container orchestration platforms such as Kubernetes, um, in that context, our microservices are packaged as containers being orchestrated by a platform that's um, it's typically running on cloud-hosted infrastructure. And it allows us to abstract away a lot of infrastructure and operational complexities, such as recovery, service discovery, load balancing, centralized configuration management, scaling, monitoring access, um, uh, aspects, and also an API gateway or, um, um, as well. So how does a Kubernetes um, um, orchestrated platform now look like in our Wardley map? So how our activities are now moving? So now the, all the um, aspects that I have mentioned before, like um, um, uh, service discovery, load balancing, and so on, are now moving from the previous top area now further down, and we don't have to um, integrate them in our business logic anymore. So these components or these are now in, in these activities are now abstracted of, uh, away from us as, as a developer, uh, which is great. But um, the Kubernetes cluster um, comes with new primitives that we have to deal with um, by configuring them. For example, a port deployment, service volume, ingress, are new primitives and a far lot more. So um, while the container orchestration is abstracting away a lot of infrastructure complexities, which is great, it comes with new primitives. New primitives are coming to the scene that we have to deal with and by configuring them. So far, we have talked about um, evolving our technology stack using open source uh, or um, cloud-hosted data services, uh, container orchestration with Kubernetes. And the next evolution step we could consider is, guess what? <laughs> we are at KamundaCon, so how can we map out Camunda into our technology stack, and how does it look like uh, as a Wardley map? So we could decide to use uh, Camunda, the open source Camunda platform running on top of our Kubernetes cluster and using um, cloud-hosted data storage. So we still have to, um, th that requires activities that are custom built. This is, these are the integration of the Camunda platform, like um, getting, uh, um, uh, subscribing to a topic or uh, completing a task and so on. So this is the integration that we have to integrate into our services. And we also need to model uh, the business process and also deploy this business process model to our Comunda platform. And we have, also, as a separate component that runs on our Kubernetes cluster, we also have to do some configuration and maintenance of itself. But it um, abstracts away um, uh, other aspects, activities such as uh, retries, uh, time attending and retries, uh, item potency, and distributed tracing. So we don't have to take care of these uh, in terms of uh, from, from using the workflow engine related activities. This is handled by the Camunda platform. And 
as announced yesterday, um, that uh, how does then um, the Camunda, the cloud-hosted Camunda as a service now could look like in, the, in our Wardley maps as the next ev um, evolution step. So when we use Camunda as a service, um, we still have to um, integrate. So the integration is the same. Uh, we still have to integrate it in, into our services. Um, we also have to model the business process itself and deploy it to, to Camunda. But um, we do not need um, uh, to, to do all the maintenance-related um, activities. For example, we don't have to take care of, sc of scaling and uh, recovery, maintenance, uh, backup mechanisms anymore. And so that's something that is abstracted away for us, from us um, using uh, Camunda as commodities. And using commodities and outsourcing commodities to utility suppliers, that's the one that helps us to focus on our core domain. So in the end, um, it's necessary that we need to um, fulfill our user and business needs and to focus on our core domain, since that's the one that gives us competitive advantage, and that's the one that we uh, should strategically invest most. That's the one, the core domain is the one that we should build in-house. That requires that we identify um, those components that are not differentiating um, us from our competitors, and also um, to identify commodities that we can outsource to utility suppliers. And we definitely have to continuously adapt to uh, evolve our technology stack over the time. And also, it um, helps us to enable uh, the evolution of components, helps us to, um, to innovate others so that we can create new features or that we can also, for example, create new components. Because in the end, we would like to build a product that fulfills our user needs and not a product that is very expensive, took a very long time to build, and is even not usable in this case. Thank you for listening. <laughs>